This video is a sequel to our Three Kingdoms Year in Review, released back in September. Please watch that video first for context on the base game. After a few months of inactivity, mostly assumed to be down to the effects of COVID-19 hampering productivity, Creative Assembly launched their latest and most ambitious DLC for Total War Three Kingdoms, coinciding with the major 1.6 patch and free DLC, which enhanced many facets of the game. The Furious Wild DLC introduces a unique subculture of factions based around the Nan Man tribes, which inhabited the regions around southern China during the Three Kingdoms conflict. Four new playable factions led by unique characters with their own unique mechanics, new units, and a completely different campaign experience is offered by this expansion. However, we will also cover the massive 1.6 patch that coincided the launch, which saw a rework and expansion of the grand campaign map and introductions of new units and new legendary heroes, all for free. We will cover the content changes and assess how it diverges the Free Kingdoms experience, whether for better or for worse, and we'll weigh up whether it's worth the price. This is Total War Three Kingdoms The Furious Wild DLC Review. The Nan Man, translated quite literally as Southern Man. They were a multi-ethnic group of tribes inhabiting the heavily forested regions of Southern China. Their history, although obscure, has been extensively chronicled in the legends of the Three Kingdoms period, especially in relation to their involvements in several campaigns initiated by the state of Shuhan. Famous characters such as Meng Ho, his wife Lady Zhurong, and King Mulu were active opponents during Zhuge Liang's southern campaigns to pacify Shu Han's southern borders. And this marked change of geography, context, and culture has seen popularity as a potential DLC idea since Three Kingdoms' release. Alas, Creative Assembly have embraced the Nan Man as their featurette for the first DLC of their second season, ushering the third new faction group after the default Han culture and Yellow Turban Rebellion available since release. Patch 1.6 introduces an expansion of the default Grand Campaign map, one of the very few instances in Total War history where the original release map has been expanded to accommodate new DLC content, and sets an interesting precedence for future Total War titles. The Han Imperial Provinces of Yi and Zhao Ji, focused on the southwestern corner of the map, have seen more commanderies added and a rework of existing borders. The map now includes much of modern-day Yunnan province and stretches down as far south into northern Vietnam. There is also a new commandery added in the northeast corner of the map, stretching the map into the Liao Dong Peninsula. I'm not sure what the purpose of this addition was, but could be a precursor to a future DLC centered around Korea. This southwestern corner of the map is now made up of a new settlement type called Nan Man Lands, denoted by an elephant icon, the traditional tribal territories of these people. Nan Man factions gain bonuses when controlling these settlements, whilst non-Nan Man factions receive penalties. Furthermore, there are also regions of dense jungle added, which provide military bonuses for Nan Man armies moving through these whilst adversely affecting non-Nan Man armies, reflecting the difficulty of campaigning in these foreign lands. It should make it particularly difficult to conquer and hold this region as the Han Imperial factions, and most players will probably opt to ignore or shut out the Nan Man instead of risking heavy effort to otherwise pacify them, creating an interesting strategic question similar to the Roman struggles in Germania. The major change that will resonate with the majority of players is the addition of Gate Passes, a special settlement that has little economic value but immense strategic importance. Like the elven fortress gates that protected Ulfuan's interior in Warhammer 2, gate passes defend key choke points on the map, usually mountain passes, many of them having crucial historical relevance in Three Kingdoms military narratives, such as Tong Pass in front of Chang'an or Hulao Pass in front of Zucheng. Gate passes are expensive to construct and maintain, but boast impenetrable walls and hefty garrisons to interdict traffic and play a huge strategic role on the campaign map. Furthermore, there has been a huge UI rework on the campaign map, a comprehensive renaming of individual settlements, towns, and cities to reflect historical accuracy. 
For instance, Yingchuan Commandery is now represented by the cities of Suchang and Chenlu, two hugely important sites during the wars between Cao Cao and Yuan Shao, for instance. The commandery of Chengdu has now been renamed to Shu, with Chengdu as its capital. Or the fact the important city of Xiapi has been added, with CA moving the previous city of Pengcheng to accommodate it. These changes don't substantially affect any mechanics per se, but they greatly assist the historical authenticity, and players who are well versed in the history of the Three Kingdoms will appreciate the flavour. All these map changes are available free to all players with the 1.6 patch, without needing to purchase the Furious Wild DLC. Creative Assembly have applied a massive front-end rework of the existing campaign, perhaps to embrace the new season and welcome new players. One of these changes is a more straightforward faction selection screen. Faction leaders will be flanked by notable starting legendaries, and their faction-specific mechanics and character traits are now separated to limit the confusion between the two. The factions are also now grouped into their historical allegiances, such as the Coalition or the Empire, giving players a sense of their faction's affinity or purpose in the campaign much better. Every single faction has also gotten reworks to their mechanics or campaign modifiers, a load of changes meant to arrest balancing issues and reflect historical authenticity better. There are honestly too many to go through, most of them are minimal, but should offer a slightly more refined campaign experience from now on. Once again, this is free for all players with the 1.6 patch. As with every patch, Creative Assembly have released more free legendaries to complement the ever-expanding roster. A new free LC, Shi Xie, has been added, the Imperial Governor of the Southern Jiaoqi Province. This addition helps to add a legendary character that is loyal to the Han near the starting positions of the new Nan Man tribes, presenting a difficult but fresh option for veteran players. Three new pivotal legendaries are added, including Wei Yan, a major figure in many of Shu Han's campaigns. According to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel, he was the one that captured the Nan Man leader, Meng Ho, and perhaps this relevance has warranted his adaptation. Zun Yu and Li Ru have also been added, both respected strategists of Cao Cao and Dong Zhou, respectively. Overall, it hasn't been the most productive patch in terms of free legendaries, especially given that almost six months ago we had the 16 characters introduced into the last major patch, 1.5. The real meat of the content is perhaps reserved for the paid Furious Wild DLC, which not only introduces an array of new legendaries, but those from a completely different cultural subset. The four Nan Man chieftains include Meng Hu and his wife, Lady Jurong. They start separate from each other, but there are scripted campaign events that trigger their historic marriage, allowing you to absorb the other's territories pretty much for free, so keep that in mind when selecting them. The other Nan Man leader in the vicinity is King Mulu, the infamous leader of tiger and elephant troops that caused much headache to Zhuge Liang when he invaded the region. Shamoke, on the other hand, starts much further east and begins in the vicinity of some major Han powers, including Sun Qian and Liu Biao. Thus, he has the most difficult starting position out of all the Nan Man tribes. Besides these tribal chieftains, there are also a couple of unique non-playable Nan Man legendaries such as Wutugu and Duo Si, who have minor roles in the romance novel. But otherwise, most of the Nan Man characters, even the notable ones such as Ahui Nan or Meng Hu's brother, Meng Yu, follow a new generic tribal template that admittedly gets tiring after a little while. This is exasperated by the fact the Nan Man don't have specific classes such as Vanguard or Champion or Strategist. They are simply just known as Nan Man. In order to differentiate them, the player can craft specific builds by investing into their personal goals, allowing flexible player-specific builds, but I also feel this detrimentally shoehorns the variety of Nan Man characters. It would have been cool to have unique tribal classes such as, I don't know, animal tamers or elemental mages. It's all very fantastical, but fantasy references were made for the Nan Man in the novel. The overarching mechanic with the Nan Man tribes is tribal fealty. Representing the innate traditions and culture of the Nan Man, these fealties can be gathered by conquering the other tribes, granting powerful faction-wide bonuses. This thus serves as an objective list, encouraging the Nan Man factions to unite the tribes before they set off into Greater China. Otherwise, each of the tribal leaders also have some of their own unique faction mechanics that adjust their playstyle in a minor way. 
The new Nanman reforms is the defining feature, split into a three category format of administrative, military and cultural reforms. Instead of choosing a reform every few turns like the Han factions, Nanman tribes research a reform over several turns, with modifiers gained from their fealties affecting their research rate. It's a traditional system similar to that of Rome to Total War. This makes Nanman factions quite primitive early on, especially diplomatically, since they can't even interact with non-Nanman factions until certain reforms are met. Their victory conditions are also different, without requiring them to interact with any emperorship mechanics or conquer the entire map. Nanman simply need to hold 50 settlements, including all of the Nanman lands in the southwestern section of the map, and hold them for a total of 20 turns. This reflects a more survival style endgame. The unified Nanman king or queen simply needs to ensure their survival against the new emerging Chinese kingdoms. How do the introduction of the Nanman and the campaign changes affect the overall progression of the campaign? The Nanman are essentially landlocked in a giant free-for-all in the early game, with an eventual winner emerging from the contest. The scripted Lady Jurong and Meng Hu event creates a huge superpower, almost nigh impossible to overturn playing as any other Nanman faction, so there is a huge imbalance issue here already. The Nanman AI are also insanely aggressive themselves, actively invading nearby lands, so leaving them to their own devices turns them into a ticking steamroll time bomb. This makes playing previously easy factions in the region such as Sun Jin suddenly quite difficult. Since there is no strong power base in this region initially to resist them, they end up being super powerful entities later on, and thus there is a huge campaign imbalance here. The Nan Man are currently way too influential and it does stain their historical authenticity as they were kind of irrelevant until around 220 CE, 30 years after the campaign start date. The introduction of gate passes is overall a positive. It slows down both the player and the AI and promotes consolidation over hyper-aggressive playstyles. For instance, you can no longer snipe the Emperor by trying to rush Chang'an since it's now defended by mountain passes from the east and south. It helps to set up more historical region blocks that take some long-term thinking and military effort to dislodge. Patch 1.6 introduced a new siege weapon to the roster, the Juggernaut. The lion's head pieces are essentially flamethrowers, delivering devastation across the battlefield. Using them as backline artillery isn't exactly a great tactic, as they have absurdly bad range and may end up hurting your own frontline infantry. However, at close ranges with openings for their firing lines, they can utterly destroy enemies. Think of them like canister shot from Empire or Napoleon Total War. Due to their mobility, their ability to fire whilst moving, and fast turn rates, they are capable of being microed by themselves to outflank enemies and act as a solo unit instead of hunkered down artillery, making them one of the most powerful units in the hands of experienced players. They are also surprisingly adept at spewing fireballs at enemy generals. The Juggernaut, however, is a very poor siege weapon. Its non-existent hard damage makes it useless against stone walls, whilst its low range makes it difficult to get into range of arrow towers or gates. Despite its shortcomings, it's an extremely fun weapon to wield and should be played more akin as assault infantry rather than a stationary support artillery. The Furious Wild DLC introduces a staggering array of units as the entire Nanman roster is unique and made from scratch. Besides your contingent of tribal warriors, there are also new beasts of war in tigers and elephants. Tigers play very similar to dogs of war in Rome 2, releasing when enemies are close to cause damage and scare on the enemy lines before your own infantry close the distance. They are thus more of a skirmish type morale debuffing unit. Elephants play as shock cavalry, delivering devastating charges onto the enemy and make up for the tribe's lack of horsemanship tradition. Nanman factions therefore have an assortment of very strong assault infantry. Their polearm infantry are mostly garbage however and should be generally avoided unless to directly counter enemy cavalry. They lack a strong archer core, instead their ranged units are compensated by slingers, poison dart blowpipes and javelin throwers. Their coup de grace though are their elephants. Without cavalry or siege weapons, elephants will be the primary source of shock power and heavy damage. Nanman tactics seem very much 
geared towards getting into your opponent's face quickly and brutally with aggressive playstyles, taking advantage of terrain with ambushing and skirmishing and absolutely obliterating generals in duels. And that's where we come to perhaps the most imbalanced part of this DLC, Nanman characters as duelists. Lady Jurong, for instance, is arguably the strongest character in the game right now, and in my save, she either won every single duel she was involved in, or everybody refused to duel her. I think it's a combination of inherent imbalance with their amazing skills, their flexibility by not being limited to skill trees, and the fact that Naman tribes are in a constant state of warfare and gain a steady trickle of experience compared to Han factions. Regardless, it's something I expect to be balanced soon. Gate pass battles are by far the most difficult battle type for an attacking side. Gate pass maps resemble Warhammer 2 Elven Fortress gate battles, with two separate gates flanking a central wall. The condensed width of the map creates a huge advantage for defenders as they can concentrate archer and artillery fire onto the advancing attacking units that don't have much space to spread out. Any attacking units that scale the wall also get attacked by archer towers placed on the other side of the fortification. I wouldn't expect any different however and feel this is the sort of impenetrability that makes gate passes quite viable. The content of the DLC, irrespective of the 1.6 patch, is no doubt fresh and different from what Total War Three Kingdoms has brought to the table this past year. It finally adds the Nanman tribes, which have been pushed by the community since the early days of release. And I thought the execution overall was refreshing and interesting, albeit quite imbalanced in its current state. My main concern, however, is that this DLC's pricing is quite extortionate compared to the amount of content it delivers. At $18.99 US dollars, it is almost double the pricing of previous chapter packs, which were meaty DLCs in their own right. And I really can't see how the price justifies the DLC at all, since it only adds the Nanman factions. The map changes, the new legendaries, and the massive front end rework all come with the free patch 1.6. It's essentially comparable to the Yellow Turban Rebellion DLC, which also added a new faction subculture, complete with their own unique characters, units, and campaign mechanics. The Yellow Turbans are actually relevant to the majority of the playing experience as they interact with Han factions from the outset, whereas the Nanman experience is kind of limited to its own little microcosm, a corner of the map if you will, until the mid and late game. In terms of essentiality, this DLC really helps to expand this empty, previously uncolonized and overlooked southwestern portion of the map. I recommend the DLC to enrich further the Free Kingdoms experience for those fans who are passionate about the story and have enjoyed the game for a long time. For new players getting into the game recently, I'd say to wait for a sale or for better bug fixing and balancing changes first. There is still plenty of content in vanilla Total War Free Kingdoms and they should look to the Furious Wild DLC once eventual boredom kicks in. I would have given this DLC an 8 out of 10 because I still think in terms of uniqueness this is the most original and divergent addition to the overall game. But it's unjustified hefty price tag, double that of previous DLCs, unfortunately has to be considered and my final score is a 6 out of 10. The Furious Wild was perhaps furiously hyped. It's been some time since the last content drop for Total War Three Kingdoms, no doubt due to the situation with COVID-19. And the community was eagerly anticipating the first DLC for the game's second season. It has thus not quite reached the heights of that anticipation, but the Furious Wild clambers high enough to pique the interest of most Three Kingdoms fans, looking to continue the rich saga or spice up their experience with a splash of tribal Nanman flair. There are questions of value and balance related to this DLC, but nothing can be said about the freshness it adds to the table. This was Total War Three Kingdoms, the Furious Wild DLC review. Thanks to these Patreon supporters for making this video possible. If you've enjoyed today's content, consider liking the video, subscribing, and supporting the channel on Patreon for more analytical reviews.